but I'm a medical and science journalist, a former New York Times writer, and uh, the author of, um, a, a, of a book that won an award on this subject, and uh, the editor of, uh, of, of another. And um, I'm also the, the um, communications director for the Berkshire Litchfield Environmental Council, which is a, a rare organization uh, that started in the 1970s and pays attention primarily to the, um, the environmental effects of uh, infrastructure. Um, and so uh, I have a long history history with this subject as a as a writer and uh, what I'd like to begin with is um to to uh, remind Stanford that you have a very very interesting history when it comes to this um, in the 1980s and the 1990s with radio frequency radiation. Um, it uh, you were actually the first municipality in the nation, and as far as I know, the last one in the nation to actually have your health department review all uh, radio frequency applications before they were approved by uh, any land use board. Um, Dr. James uh, McBride, uh, who was a, a MD, and Phyllis Erlinson um, uh, measured ambient background levels before and after RF facilities were erected. Uh, the program unfortunately faded after they retired in the late 1990s. But if that data still exists, either at the um, uh, at the health department or uh, with the land use uh, boards, you have a very, very good um, uh, 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 set of data there uh, that would make excellent baselines to compare against any future readings. Until the 1970s, states could actually, or uh, until the 1990s, states could actually write their own RF standards. Massachusetts was the first to adopt a very stringent Russian standard, while Connecticut adopted a thousand times more lenient industry IEEE standard. The Telecommunications Act of 96 preempted uh, key state powers, as we've been reminded already, um, but not all, but not all of them, and others will address that uh, uh, more um, uh, 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 closely after uh, after this. Small cells are actually changing everything at the uh, at the local level. Um, before the land use board of representatives is is the proposal that's been described that took uh, two years, uh, five to and five towns to hammer out with the telecom providers and and um, uh, the court arbitrator. Um, uh, clearly, much work went into this, and there was a lot of thought that went into it, and all uh, sides were uh, attempted to be um, uh, 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 represented. Although. Every Everybody that you're hearing from tonight, these perspectives have been left out. Um, and uh, classic mistakes were made regarding uh, too little information that was provided to you, in my opinion, and a very narrow interpretation of existing laws. Others will address you on that tonight. The decision made here, uh, whenever that uh, comes about, uh, has the ability to affect statewide land use laws and, and much farther beyond, depending on how far you want to take this. Stanford has the opportunity to actually get this right and perhaps even change national law. The group of speakers tonight has in-depth knowledge that is rarely available at the local level. Please make good use of us if you're inclined to do so. In a nutshell, this story, um, I'm, I'm begging you, uh, don't fall for conspiracy nuttiness. There's just way too much of that out there. There are very good reasons why people are concerned about 5G and small cells positioned close to uh, where people live and work. Um, we are actually in an exponential infrastructure leap that creates exposures unlike any we have ever experienced before in kind, duration, and intensity. There are major, major holes at federal and state agencies that leave all living uh, uh, things vulnerable to novel gen genotoxins that increase daily as new tech is introduced. RF is actually a form of energetic air pollution if it was regulated as such. Um, uh, I'd like to call your attention to uh, uh, an amicus brief that Senator Blumenthal wrote in uh, 2004. Problems at the FCC have been known for decades. FCC is not a health agency. It defers to outside entities, yet it controls exposures. Interestingly enough, they control for environmental exposures, but any standards that exist are for humans only. There are no standards to protect the environment. Don't fool yourselves on that one. It would make a very good legal challenge. In 2004, then Connecticut Attorney General Richard Blumenthal wrote an amicus curiae brief for a petition for certiorari at the U.S. Supreme Court for a petitioner EMF network. The brief strongly pointed out the dereliction of FCC's duty when it has the awesome power to protect, yet refuses to take current science into consideration. That brief was almost 20 years ago, and nothing has changed at FCC. Today, there are no agencies to advise FCC other than the FDA 
FDA, which has jurisdiction over devices like cell phones, not ambient exposures from infrastructure like towers and small cells. The Stanford Board of uh, Representatives is therefore working in a serious state and federal vacuum and certainly has the right to challenge it, in my opinion. Theodora Scarato uh, from the Environmental Health um, um, uh, Trust will uh, address this and so will others. In uh, 2010, um, I and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Henry Lai, who is a world-class researcher, um, investigated the vanishing, uh, vanishingly low-level effects near uh, near cell towers, uh, low-level effects in the literature uh, that would be comparable to anyone living near a cell tower and certainly a small cell. Um, the, the, that 2010 paper was the first to tease out the vanishingly low-level biological effects studies that are comp comp uh, 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 com uh, comparable to ambient uh, far-field exposures near, uh, near infrastructure. This is exactly the information needed to establish health effects patterns uh, for today's chronic low-level exposures. Unfortunately, that information is usually lost to uh, public health policy um, because it uh, gets sort of averaged away in in meta-analysis. Calling the right information goes far beyond accusations of cherry picking. You have to know exactly what you're doing if you're going to wander into a whole new area of uh, exploration. Our 2010 paper uh, was published by um, Canada's National Research Council Press, and it directly challenged the status quo. Um, it has had over 70,000 downloads, believe it or not, which is unheard of in an academic publication. We then applied that same approach along with uh, Albert May Anvil, who's a renowned uh, wildlife biologist, to non-human species after determining that there was, in fact, enough data on measured rising ambient levels to match the low-level effects literature to non-human species. That was also something that had never been done before. Human spe humans are not the only species impacted. The primary concern of the Stanford BOR is for human health, but that fits into a much larger um, environmental em envelope. The FCC has never conducted NEPA, NEPA reviews for RF or 5G, which is required by federal law. In fact, FCC has tried to eliminate involvement with all NEPA reviews, including the increasing satellites filling the lower atmosphere, radiating back to uh, every area of the planet today. The state of Connecticut has not requested a NEPA review, nor conducted any environmental assessments regarding 5G small cell buildouts. These are serious emissions at the federal and state levels, given what is known about unique sensitivities of other species to non-ionizing radiation and their very unusual physical characteristics adapted over eons to very low levels of perceptual abilities that um, rely on that they rely on for humans for uh, survival what and what adversely affects the environment and non-human species eventually affects humans too the environment the total environment must be considered when it comes to uh, to, to these um, um, uh, exposures all living things have evolved within a matrix of natural ionizing electromagnetic fields. It has long been known that the geomagnetic field is needed to coordinate embryonic development in many species and provides directional information for many migratory species, including birds, fish, turtles, and insects. Highly sensitive natural mechanisms are widely found in many non-human species in specialized electroreceptor cells that enable living organisms to detect the presence and immediate changes in environmental fields at low, very low intensities. Many species can be easily disturbed by the presence of unfamiliar low-intensity man-made fields. 5G is different. Man-made fields um, uh, use unusual signaling characteristics, odd waveforms, and modulations at intensities that are simply not found in nature. But 5G utilizes for the first time even more novel signaling characteristics that uh, some of the other speakers will address, and higher frequencies that are capable of affecting insect populations in particular. Nothing like 5G has ever been used before in broad civilian applications. 5G is being deployed without environmental review of any kind. Biological disturbance happens at very low intensities to unfamiliar fields, far below even the Earth's geomagnetic field, similar to natural cellular biocurrent. And novel EMF exposures do not allow living organisms to adjust, uh, uh, since signaling characteristics change rapidly as new technologies are constantly being developed. Species cannot adapt or evolve with them. 
Um, insects are the most vulnerable. What impacts in insects certainly impacts all of us. 5G in particular may impact insect populations as millimeter wave frequencies couple maximally with some insects. Insects the size of fruit flies reach peak absorption in the upper microwave bands. Both thermal and non-thermal effects are, will likely occur with 5G. Honeybees are also well modeled. 5G in, is, is particularly uh, lethal to, uh, to honeybees. And there are some uh, studies that are listed uh, in the bottom of the slides if anyone wants to uh, check further. Um, insects are very inefficient thermoregulators and are particularly vulnerable to temperature changes. New exposure regulations in Europe allow for higher RF exposures in the 5G ranges and are expected to top heating thresholds even for humans. U.S. regulations already allow higher exposures in 5G frequencies. Um, uh, we are flirting with catastrophic, catastrophic impacts from insect, insect deaths alone, capable of punching holes in the entire food web. The human uh, food supply is also endangered by this. Um, we, these were the, uh, the studies that I referred to that we then went on to extrapolate um, when we realized there was enough research to extrapolate to ecosystem levels. That had never been done before. Um, these papers are, are being very widely read, and I um, uh, uh, refer people to them uh, if, if they so choose. Um, Dr. Lai and I also, um, in the last uh, year, have written um, uh, peer-reviewed papers on the roles of intensity, exposure, duration, and modulation, and uh, a recent, a more recent paper on cellular and molecular effects, molecular effects to non-ionizing radiation. What we generally found uh, was that certainly there was enough research in all five animal kingdoms and uh, taxa studied. Dr. Lai broke out um, extensive tables for anyone who in the uh, wildlife <clears throat> list. Um, if, if you care to pursue them. And we, cite, we ended up citing over a thousand studies in the three papers um, and with more being added all the time. Um, no one had compared the rising levels uh, with low level literature before. There was a wealth of data uh, uh, that uh, led to the ecosystem perspective. Um, one of the things that uh, that that we um, uh, discovered in in reviewing this research was that a very clear pattern emerged when it came to uh, the flora studies. Plants, trees, and seeds respond positively to natural static ELF fields like um, uh, like the Earth's geomagnetic field, but they adversely uh, react to um, uh, uh, the alternating current power line frequencies, and they especially don't like RF. Um, this is particularly relevant for any city concerned with urban forestry with parks and uh, tree cover in a warming world. Small cells bring RF very close to flora, expect deflor uh, defoliation. There are uh, some devastating photos from Europe of uh, slow tree dieback after cell antennas were installed. Um, uh, the Environmental Health Trust has those and an excellent, excellent website for, uh, for people to refer to. Um, Increases in ambient levels uh, between the 1980s and today directly parallel unprecedented species losses among other factors like climate change. Um, then there's, I threw up a um, one slide that um, uh, shows uh, wildlife reviews um, for anyone if they want to uh, pursue them, the work is there. These are major reviews that most environmentalists and regulators are unaware of. Um, all of this research um, is is out there, and um, and then I uh, have some uh, information about what can be done nationally and what Stanford can do. Um, if anyone wants to um, to ask me about that later, I have some good ideas for you that um, that you might want to consider because there are holes in the review process that uh, occurred both at Pura and things that have been left out um, that are actually reflected in what what should be a very good model for the state um, um, in terms of small cell buildouts and in my estimation turns out not to be. And I yield back, thank you.